guys, we're live. Welcome in. We got a couple guests on here already. We're going to be going through the underwriting today for our 45 unit, kind of diving deep, going through the spreadsheet and kind of telling you about the deal and giving you just an overall picture of it. So we wanted to see, we're actually going to try it. Okay, we're live on Instagram as well now. We actually just started our webinar a couple minutes ago, have a couple guests logged in. Uh, we're also live on our YouTube channel. So wanted to give Everybody on Instagram, you won't be able to see it on Instagram, kind of going through the spreadsheet and the underwriting, but I did want to tease it for a couple minutes for you guys. And if when we do log off of here, I encourage you guys to go on the link. If you go to the link in my story right now, you'll be able to directly link into like see the actual underwriting, see me sharing my screen and kind of go through the whole deal. So check that out, guys. But I'll give you kind of an overview right now. And if all else, if you guys don't have time, hopefully this will inspire you guys to go watch the full link video and dive deep and to see the underwriting. So the reason why I wanted to take you guys through this today is to show you like how I underwrite deals. So you might be a real estate investor right now who's interested in doing multifamily and how do you look at run the numbers or maybe you're just a, a math or an engineer brain like me and you just like running through numbers and like understanding how the real estate aspect works. And also this is gonna be great for like our private money lenders and private money partners who might wanna lend or partner on a deal like this. And so they can see exactly like what we're looking at what are the important drivers? Like, how do we, like, how do we mitigate different risks? How do we if, just the whole picture, right? And just be very transparent. I think a lot of times people don't, or at least feedback when I've talked to a lot of investors is sometimes people are like, other investors aren't as full disclosure as how they run their numbers, how they make assumptions. So I want to open up that curtain as much as I can for you guys, because at the end of the day, people usually only invest in things that they understand. So I want to show you guys all that today. Um, Let's just start off too. I'm going to be sharing my screen here on the actual um, Riverside podcast. So I'm going to share my screen so you guys can kind of see some of the highlights of this before we log off of Instagram. So now you guys can kind of see the underwriting, but I kind of wanted to highlight the deal, right? Like we always talk about how do we find the deal? How do we fund the deal and how do we fix it up? So how we found this deal, I talked about that last week, but basically we went and we, we do a ton of direct seller marketing. I think this one came through a postcard and we've been, I've been negotiating with the seller for about a month now. And I could tell immediately when I talked to her, I'm like, this is exactly the type of deal you're looking for. Cause the seller was tired. It was definitely a tired landlord. The house had been handed down um, to her from her family. And as I started to dig in, there's been a lot of probably mismanagement over the years and there's a ton of vacant units and, a, and, and there's a ton of work that hasn't been done. And that's a big project that a lot of people don't want to take on, especially in a town where it's hard to find contractors. So that could be a huge, huge headache. So, but I looked at it as this is a huge opportunity for us who have contractors who know how to turn properties. Cause again, we've just almost gone full circle on a project just like this in Casper. And we've kind of, we've learned a lot of hard lessons on that one and it's been very successful. So we're excited to take those best practices and implement it here. So that's kind of how we found the deal. Been negotiating for a while. As I kind of talked last week, it's a really cool seller finance thing, which I'll kind of show you how that's under underwritten today. Um, we'll go into that. Um, and that kind of leads into the funding of the deal, right? So how we're funding it is we're going to use some private money lenders capital in first position, which is really cool. And I'll show you guys that today, how that's going to work. But they're in first position and the seller is carrying uh, the remaining of the note in second position. Um, and then we'll basically be financing the purchase price plus the rehab with the private money lenders. And then again, using the second position with the seller and kind of bundling all that up to buy it. And then our goal is within two years, we're going to refinance and be able to hopefully get all of our money. I'm hoping we're actually going to bring money out of the project to where we can cash out a little bit. But we'll, the other goal will be to pay off the first off, pay off the private money lender first, and then also pay off the seller who's got a second. So that's all. That's a goal within two years and then have a great cash flowing asset and ideally do the birth strategy. And when you could do the, the birth strategy is beautiful. When we talk the birth strategy, that's buy, rehab, refinance, rent, and repeat. So, or those R's, the last couple of R's could go interchangeably, but that is a super efficient strategy in real estate and great to do on single family houses. But if you could do it at multifamily at scale, you're just, I mean, everything is, everything's at scale and you can do it all at once and create a ton of value all at once. So that's kind of the financing, right? So we talked about finding it, financing it, and um, the last thing is fixing it, which is gonna be the renovations, right? We've already kind of started to, me and my project manager, we're talking today. We've already 
Um, we're already getting inspectors out there, talking to electricians, talking to finish off roofs and figure out what it's going to take to mobilize a crew down here so we can get this rehab done because that's a huge, huge component of it um, and where a bunch of this value is. So before I get into the underwriting, I want to explain kind of some of the assumptions and, and some of the, um, which I've been sharing the wrong screen, I'm sharing some of my old notes from the seller, but I want to get into like the comparables, right? And this also talks about the market. Um, so before I get into kind of some of the rents that I pulled, well, let's start there. I'll start from the top. So I pulled some comps because one of the first things when you're underwriting a multifamily deal is you got to figure out how much rent are we going to get? Like, what do the comparables say? So I pulled a couple three bedrooms because this this has a unit mix of three bedroom, one bath, some are one and a half and two bedroom, one bath, like kind of your prototypical multifamily unit. So and those are the so three ones and two ones. And we, when we kind of did some of the comps, you're seeing anywhere from like $1,100 to um, almost $1,200 for the three bedrooms. I know in other parts of Wyoming, you're getting a lot more, which is definitely where I see the upside of this. And then the second thing is the two bedroom, one bath. We're seeing around, um, I think on the, you know what, I was told that they were 800, but I'm not seeing anything listed at 800. Um, everything was around $1,000 a month. And the other cool thing is I saw um, uh, a furnished unit for 1650, which I think is a huge upside of this property. One of the many ones, which is also part of my underwriting, which I'm going to show you guys, because if we could furnish some of these units, we're going to make even more cash flow. So that kind of shows you some of the comps that we're running our rental numbers off of. Uh, but I want to talk about the location and a little bit of the upside of this property. So first off, you guys, I've talked a lot about this. I actually have a link in here and I'm, I'm clicking it right now in the presentation. But this talks about that it's Bill Gates is doing this big nuclear plant in Kemmer, Wyoming. So Kemmer is very close. Um, if, if you look at my map here, you can see Kemmer is i'm just going to slide this over kemmer is about well i'm circling it on the map but not far to evanston um i should have this right on here but i would say 30 to 45 minutes from evanston and that's where that um that nuclear plant is going to go into so that's going to bring a ton of jobs i was told by one property manager in evanston that this will like double the population of evanston if that happens all these numbers are going to get blown out of the water because there's not going to be enough housing so that's one of the big parts of this um the other parts is proximity with with Evanston, I showed on this map that you were 63 miles from Park City and just a little bit farther down the road is Salt Lake City. So we're really close to some really high end markets that are very unaffordable for the average person. Um, and then I kind of put some of this in here for affordability. The average home price in Evanston is 275,000. In Park City, it's 1.5 million. And in Salt Lake City, uh, which obviously is a bigger, it's, well, as you know, Park City is a mountain town. It's going to be very high end. But Salt Lake City is 585,000. I looked at Denver to kind of compare it. Denver was right around the same. It was about 595. So think of Denver pricing if you're not from Salt Lake and having a town that's like pretty much within an hour of that and just all the people that are just going to commute. Because, I mean, that is a huge disparity. And, and especially when you're looking at rents, right? Like you could still find some rentals in this town. Um, well, actually, you can't find anything for 800 right now, but... Um, but even up to a thousand. So I think it's a very affordable market and all of my numbers are under underwrote to sh to take on this lower scenario, right? It's all based on the, the current one. So yeah, somebody asked so far about the furnishing for the LTR. Yeah, hundred percent. We've, that's actually in my second, one of my scenarios of like the cost to go furnish it. But, and I think I was pretty conservative. I, I did, um, I did only, I only did 1.5. Well, you know what? I'll show you guys. Um, if you guys do, I definitely would encourage you guys. I'm about to sign off of Instagram, but I want you guys, again, go to my story and you can kind of see. If you have trouble getting in, um, let me know. Send me a direct message and I'll send you a recording. But it's really going to be cool to see it's like all the rent rolls and, and all the underwriting. So anyway, I think that's a good. I've got links in here too for all the different rentals that I went and pulled. Um, but yeah, let's kind of segue now into the rent rolls. And I'll probably sign off of Instagram. So again, Guys, please do, if you don't get this, if you can't get onto the webinar, I'll say it one more time, send me a direct message. I'll send you the recording because I want you guys to be able to see this. And if you have questions after the recording, feel free to send me messages. And yeah, keep asking questions too as we go because I know some of this might be brand new to you guys and I'm happy to help you any way I can. All right, we're going to sign off of Instagram. Okay, so now we're here in the Riverside. So feel free, guys, to type any questions. Um, or honestly, just speak up because I'll be—I'm going to be driving my screen and won't quite see all the questions in the chat. But um, feel free to ask any if you guys have some. So let's talk about the rent. So this is how I broke this up. This is 45 units. There are one. There's actually eight lots and eight buildings. It's about 1.61 acres to give you a feel for this lot. So these are all the buildings here: building one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. 
So I went by apartments and I've got the apartment number. So basically to frame this up, I've got a low. So this isn't a fancy spreadsheet, guys. This is, um, I put this together a while back on our last multifamily and then I modified it. Definitely would love to make it into a template. My hope is I can actually teach my team to underwrite these deals so I can be kind of more looking at the numbers once they've done the underwriting. But I, I did this, all this underwriting myself. So I have the current rents. Um, as you can see, there's a ton of vacant units, but at least I have some units that are, um, that are, that are rented. And at least we know we have tenants in those. And that's kind of how I was doing some of my budgeting on the rehabs. I do have a walkthrough I was going to share with you guys at some point too. Probably won't be today, um, but I do have some walkthroughs of these units. We, me and my uh, project manager, for example, this building, I walked all 10 units and I can see why they were like all, these all needed a lot of work. So before we get into the rents, I actually estimated the rehabs on all of these. And I'm basing these rehabs based off of, we've gotten pretty good at doing these same type of units in Casper. So we kind of know what materials and like what a full like scope rehab looks like. And this $20,000 is a pretty good estimate for a, a two bedroom, one bath, like full gut or not. I shouldn't say full gut, like, but this is pretty much touching everything from paint to flooring, to new kitchen, to new bathroom windows. Um, typically we're putting in new window units. Like we're typically not taking out drywall is about the only thing that's left, but we typically are repairing drywall or sometimes even replacing drywall. So that's where that 20,000 comes and. This column basically totals all my rehab quotes. We're gonna continue to dial in on this one, but this is kind of a good overall number for it. But what I also did is on my um, on these units that have tenants, typically those are obviously livable. So I put in a $5,000 budget. And again, this is learnings from our last full team family is we found out that we had to evict a bunch of people and then go spend money on those units. And we definitely underestimated how much money were in those ones. Cause it's, sometimes you can't get into every single unit that's occupied. So we put in a placeholder of about $5,000 on those units, again, we're intending to just go in there and probably clean them up and keep them as a regular rental um, and not like redo completely gut it. So I think this is a pretty conservative number when it comes. So if you total it all up, it's about $685,000 of rehab that we're gonna be doing on the property. Okay, now let's talk about rents. So again, I've talked about this as the current ones, which are, I think are way under market rent. I can go into the details of this property more on like the history of it, but we've been doing quite a bit of research talking to other contractors and property managers around town that know this property it's definitely had its share of bad owners over the years which again we just went through the exact same thing in casper where property that had been mismanaged for years had a bad reputation and you just kind of have to fight through it and but we've just really uh for lack of a better word had to clean house on the current tenants that we didn't screen and we had to get in tenants who we could screen and qualify that were actually qualified to rent and and afford the rent and could actually pay the rent so we had to turn over a lot of tenants and we're expecting that on this one too. And I don't actually think it's a bad thing that it has a lot of vacancy because that just allows us to get in good tenants from the start versus having to go in and evict people. Um, so I kind of ran a low case, a base case. I feel really good about this one. I ran the low just to be like, all right, what does it look like if things went really bad? Um, and then the high, and then this STR one is the short-term one. So that's what somebody was asking earlier. I just did one and a half times the high scenario of what I think we could get for a furnished two bedroom, one bath. And again, these would be like brand new, really nice, or I shouldn't say brand new, completely remodeled, nice two bedroom, one bath units. And I think 1800 for a two bed, one bath is on par there. And what I did actually, just to fully explain this short term rental mix, I didn't put, I wouldn't make all 45 units short terms, but I did a total of, um, you can see it right here. I did a total of, I think about half of them. So the count here is 22 out of the 45. I said half of them we made short-term rentals would be an estimate there. But anyway, I just basically took those comps from the last, what I shared earlier, is that is my base case. I'm saying a thousand bucks for the two bedrooms and 1200 for the high, or sorry, and 1150 for the three bedrooms. Yeah, again, you can kind of see the mix over here. I've got bed, bath count and all that. Um, again, I really think, I think it's very likely we hit the high scenario, especially with all the jobs coming and all the demand for this area. I think it's very likely, and we just have a really a track record and a history of being able to um, get higher market rents because we our units are nicer. We take better care of the tenants and we, I think, do a better job marketing our property. So I, I feel really good about this high scenario based on everything that's happening. But you guys will still see as we move into the next one, both all three of these scenarios will still pencil and look really sharp. So any questions, I'll pause for a second before I go into the underwriting, which is gonna kind of break down the values and the expenses. Go check the questions. Okay, 
Looks like we're pretty good so far. All right. Well, we'll keep rolling. So now to look at the full interactive. So now you can see these different um, scenarios, right? So we have the current rent, the low, base, high, and STR high. These are the same from the last page, right? So now we're incorporating in the expenses. This, These rents, again, this came from that tab. It's literally just feeding from that tab. Um, I have another space for other income if we want to charge for laundry. I currently aren't. To me, that'll just be icing on top, but I'm not accounting for any income that way. I did put in some costs for utilities, um, saying that we would pay for, for example, water. But I mean, our typical strategy is we actually bill that to the tenant. So that potentially would be zero, but I, I wanted to put a number in there to be safe. I ran all the taxes. The beauty of when you're underwriting taxes, that's something you can pull on the state website or on the county website. So all that I pulled this morning. So that's all accurate. Um, all this 5% means that sometimes I'll use like a 5% of the, um, I can show you the equation, but sometimes you can make an estimate based on well, for example, in Wyoming, it's like 0 0.07, um, or sorry, 0.7 of a percent. So it'd be like 0 0.007 times the assessed value is typically, like, let's actually try it. Um, see how close that is. Let's, and who knows what this thing is, what the county, I don't have the number what the county is assessing it for. Let's say the county assesses this thing at 2 million. That would be 14,000 a year. And if we divided that by 12, because I got this per month, oh, that's pretty close. Yep. So. 1166 a month, I'm estimating, or I got it off the website, it's 1300. So that's kind of a gut check. Um, and then insurance, that's another one I'm waiting on my quote for it, but I kind of went off the insurance that I'm paying at this other, my other multifamily in Wyoming. So we have estimated insurance. But again, these ones should stay consistent across the board, right? Your insurance and your taxes don't change on based on how many units you have rented. The ones, the more variable ones are, these are your operating expenses. So I did seven and a half percent of the total rents. This one does change, right? So the more units I have, um, the typically the higher cost in operating expenses. Also, the next one is property management, right? Typically, will or every property management will charge anywhere. I'm I'm a little bit. No, oh, it depends. I've seen them anywhere from self seven to twelve percent on property management. We're currently going to pencil in seven and a half percent. Again, this is just multiplied by. The total rents and obviously increases as we increases as the higher scenario rents go. The other one is vacancy. I still calculated in seven and a half percent. Um, I've seen that fluctuate all over Wyoming. Again, we I'll, I'll tell you this. I don't know if I've ever shared this like outward facing, but internally, our team, our goal is to have 98 percent of our properties occupied. Like we shoot for 98. So I literally calculate how much possible rent can I get on my portfolio and how much are we getting? And if our team's goal is to get 98%, so that means we're literally 2% vacancy across my whole portfolio. So seven and a half is pretty, and that's just because there's a lot of demand in the markets we invest in. Um, so anyway, totaling all the expenses here, this line, then I get our NOI. So NOI is our net operating income. So that's simply all of our rent, all the income minus all the expenses. So you can kind of see this. So this is what's gonna drive the value and obviously drive the cash flow. I ran that per year as well. So simply multiply it by 12. So now let's talk about the deal structure and how it's set up. So how the cash to the seller on this thing is they're getting $250,000 down. So that's what's going to go out the door to the seller across the board. Again, pretty much all these numbers are the same horizontally because it doesn't change. I'm just showing the structure. Purchase price. This is our total purchase price. And then here is our improvements. This is the, my estimated improvements um, with some extra cushion. And I think this also has our, our wholesale fee all baked into this number. So that would be cash needed to come to closing on this deal. As you'll see, this one's a little bit higher. This is because I estimated 7,500 bucks times 20 units to do to furnish them for Airbnbs. So obviously the furnished scenario has a higher cost, but you'll see it has a much higher return. The seller, let's keep moving. So the seller carry loan. So this is, it's, this is the other cool thing I negotiated was the seller, this is the amount of the seller carry loan. And then this is the amount of the private money loan. Um, so anyways, we keep going. Yeah, and the private money loan is simply gonna be the, the, the rehab amount. You can see this here. It's the rehab amount plus the improvements plus the cash to the seller. That's how much money we're gonna borrow from our private money lenders. And this we're calculating at 10%. So this is the payment to the private money lenders per year. This is the payment to the, the seller or the person in second position um, doing the carry back. So that's 5%. This is 10. So this kind of shows you the debt service now, right? Because the cool beauty is we're not using a bank, which makes this deal so much easier to do. Um, 
But you would see the bank would love this deal based on the underwriting and the cash flow. And we'll get to the bank here in a second because we use them on the back end. So I wanted to look at, all right, so now what is our net operating? This is just, this simply is the same numbers as they were up above. You can see this here. So if you look at the NOI and then you take out, I did have a fund management fee in case I'm doing this in a fund, but right now this isn't in a fund. But if you look at the cash flow, obviously it's negative right now significantly. But if you look at our low, medium, high, and our short-term rental, this is the yearly cash flow after debt service. Like if it's, if we're hitting all our, if once we're fully occupied minus, again, we've got some, some wiggle room in here for vacancy. So you can see the cash flow on this thing as it sits now. It looks really, really good. But we want to look at, again, I told you we want to go refinance this and we want to pull out our capital or, or basically we're going to pay back our private money lenders and pay back the seller. Our goal is to do that. We're going to target that between 12 to 24 months. So here is our post refi loan. So essentially for me to, all this is doing is paying back the total purchase price, which again, the total purchase price was made up of, if you look at this again, it was just looking at the improvements plus the purchase price. So my thought is let's get all that money back and that would be our new loan. So I kind of ran a quick amortization. You can see it over here. Based on like 30 year rates, um, these again can fluctuate, but you could typically get with long-term agency debt, you can get better rates and you can get over 30 years. So I just did this loan amount. This is a mortgage payment um, monthly. Yeah, over a 30 year amortization five and 5.75%. So these are parameters I can easily change if needed and try this different ways. But let's just look at that. So now I wanted to just see, okay, will it still cover the debt once I take out, once I refi it out, will it still service itself? Because a lot of people are like, oh, well, you pull all your money out, now you lost your cash flow. But you'll see it still works and you'll look at the, well, okay, so first off, recap, we got our NOI again, same NOI from above and our debt service. So if we look at the low, again, we're looking at, this is our low base high and, and medium. So our low is still going to, um, this is still going to be the cash flow on it. It's like 231. Um, sorry, sorry, this is our debt service. Take that back. This is our debt service. Um, this is basically just taking the, the mortgage amount times 12. So what I did is I ran a DSCR calculation to show you guys like, hey, would a lender do it? So in the low scenario, we're at 1.21. In the medium, we're at 1.3. And high is 1.46. So I'm seeing DSCR lenders who will do 1.25. I've seen some that will do 1.15, which is um, pretty aggressive. But anyway, you can see this thing will still debt service even after we go pull out all the money based on this. So this is really important to make sure, hey, can we refi out of this and will the numbers wait? Makes sense. The last thing I was going to show you guys is what, it, what is this thing going to be worth once it's all done? So I ran this thing, and this is a very simple calculation. And if you guys don't understand cap rate, this is a good time to tune in because this is a very, it's a pretty simple equation, but a lot of people um, can get confused. But it's simply, you just assign a cap rate. And again, this is market dependent. So I ran a cap rate at 5% all the way to 10. I can tell you, if you're getting a 10% right now in today's market multifamily, you are doing something right. Like historically that's a lot of people good investors are like i got to get at least a 10 cap and if you got a 10 cap you're doing well right now i can tell you what we're seeing in laramie places like sheridan wyoming hot markets people are buying properties at like a five and a half cap five caps um down here in texas and austin places like that they're buying like three three and a half cap rates which is absurd to me but so I think this is pretty conservative. I started at the five cap all the way up to a 10. I think we'll land somewhere around there. Honestly, we'll probably land somewhere here in the middle. So what I did is I all this is calculating is the NOI. So to calculate cap rate, all you're doing is just dividing the income, the NOI, and you're dividing that by the cap rate. That gives you the value. And that's a simple way that almost all multifamily is calculated. They'll also look at the comparables, but really the comparables will be given to show a cap rate and understand, hey, what is the cap rate for this property? We could have a whole other webinar on cap rates and how they're decided and what how to assign a cap rate. But for now, I just wanted to show you a couple of ranges. So check out the value on this thing. Again, I'm in it for three point, at the end of the day, I'm gonna be in it for about 3.3 million. So as far as if I hit my low case, it's worth four, you start to see, and this is at an eight cap, which I think is a pretty conservative cap rate. Very conservative, honestly. Honestly, 4.5. If I start to hit this one where I think we were, we're at five and a half million. And I could make another table to show you guys the math on the equity created. But let's say we hit this one. That's 5.5 million out of 3.3. We just created 
what is that? That's that's over $2 million of equity in this property by, again, by doing this value add, um, taking a risk on something that no one knows how to go renovate and going and getting tenants and doing all that. So anyway, that, and you look at, say we sold this thing on a seven cap rate, which they're, I don't think that's unreasonable. I mean, the numbers start to get really crazy high. Um, and over time, anyway, I mean, that's what gets me really excited about this. Here was the last thing too. I wanted to make sure, hey, can we get cashed out at 75%? So let me explain this really quick. So I told you up here, like I want to be able to cash out and, and be able to get a loan for 3.31 million. That will allow me to pay back the private money lenders and pay back the seller and get a bank loan on it. So to do that, I'm going to, the bank is going to lend typically 75%. So I did a 75% LTV. So essentially I'm like, all right, well, to get this 75%, like where would my, um, what would the value have to look like? So basically I just divided it by 0.75. So my property would have, this property when it was all done would just have to appraise for this much. So I highlighted everything in green. As long as we hit one of these scenarios in green, it would appraise for enough to be able to get the, basically get the money back. Does that make sense? So you could just see, this is just simply doing the, this number times 0.75. And as long as this number is greater than my 3.1, Essentially, this is how the loan, I, here's a better, easier way to s explain this. So I want to think about if I'm ready to refi and anybody's ever done a refi, you're going to the bank and they're going to do an appraisal. So you would need to, it would have to appraise for a higher, a, high, a number high enough that I can let, they will lend me 75%. Because think about a, a big bank is probably going to only go to 75% of the appraised value. So all this is doing is multiplying all these values by 75%. So that would be my new loan amount. So if this number down here is greater than my than my all-in price of 3.3, then that means I got all my money back. And in some of these scenarios, I'm getting a bunch of money back in a, in the form of a cash out refi, which is really cool. Which is if you could do the Burr strategy and get money back, that's an absolute home run. I mean, just being able to break even is great. Even leaving some money in. Let's say that we did this one. Let's say it goes really bad and we only get a nine cap rate. That's 2.6. That would mean I left $700,000 in this deal because all I'm doing is taking the difference between 3.3 million and 2.6. So that would mean I left $700,000 in the deal. If we went and looked at my cash on cash return that I'm getting on that, I'm pretty sure it's still really good based on, because um, that would be a lesser loan amount and I'd have more cash flow. But anyway, you can see in almost all these scenarios, all these ones highlighted in green, we're able to get all of our money back. So. That's how we're looking at this. This is kind of a summary on it. I'm going to um, pause for any questions. Come on, guys. Don't be shy. Although I know somebody's, some of you guys are having issues with your microphones. Okay, so you've gone through all the details. How often do you feel like uh, these types of deals come about and with, like, with the type of marketing you're doing uh, and, and maybe on a domestic level, like nationally for the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. The short answer is not very often at all. I mean, yeah, we do a ton of marketing. I, I work, our goal in the Q1 was I work with like 15 different leads a week, like new leads coming in that I'm working. Um, we're ramping that up to like 30. But I mean, think I've been consistently doing that for several years now. And I've seen a, probably a total of two deals that look like this. The first one that we did in Casper and now this one. And this one, I mean, because of the seller financing terms looks even better. In terms of like overall value, it looks similar, but also there's not a big constraint for housing. I mean, there is in Casper, there's all still a shortage, not the shortage that's potentially gonna happen on this asset. So I would say it's very rare and it's also very rare to like find, okay, a couple things are very rare. First thing is finding a multifamily value add is hard, right? Everyone wants like the best real estate investors out there that are doing multifamily, finding something that is distressed, that is under occupied, and needs work and you're able to buy at a discount is it's very hard to find because those are the best that's the way you hit a home run is you go in and you do value add value add is just much more predictable hopefully you guys saw that through this underwriting today value add in multifamily is way more predictable than on a single family house and a flip because you're literally you're basing it off of rents which i showed you and you're basing it off expenses a lot of those things you can predict right you can you, once you do it enough times, you know what your, you know roughly what your expenses are going to be. You know pretty good what your rents are going to be. And that's how you derive a value. And it's all, again, it's at the end of the day, your value of your property is based off of how much income you bring in minus your expenses. So if you can drive expenses down and revenue up, 
you just increase the value of your property versus the value of a flip or like a single family house is purely dictated on the comparables on the houses around you, which you can't really control that, right? You can't control what your what happens in the market or what happens to your other, like how, how the market, what the, what the, what interest rates do and stuff like that. And inter interest rates and what things they're selling for the impact multifamily, but not quite as dramatic. And, and again, it's all relative, right? It's all, all that does is impact these cap rates that I talked about. Those are dictated by interest rates and what's happening in the market. But this income, you can, that's the cool thing about multifamily is you can drive, you can drive the income, you can drive the expenses, like I said. So it's, these are very hard to come by multifamily deals that have value add because when you do it right, you could create a ton of equity and a ton of cap or I mean, a ton of wealth, honestly. And then the second thing is it was really, really uncommon to find a seller that will not only do this, but do it on terms. Most sellers that they're going to sell at a discount, they're going to want cash and they want it all done. And that means you're going to have to go to a bank. You're going to have to get a bank on board with a deal like this, which banks are much more like the multifamily ones once they're stabilized. Like there's the banks will perceive the risk of this deal because I mean, the bank to be fully transparent with you guys, the bank's going to look at this and they're going to be like, well, look at the rents. Now this is losing a bunch of money. But again, as we show you the story and show you the comparables, once you fix these units up, really good question, long answer, but just wanted to really highlight how rare these are to come by. And yeah, I mean, I don't know, just any investor I talk to, the last thing I'll say on that is most investors eventually want to work up to multifamily, but when you get up to multifamily, that's where the highest level I think investors are. And that's where the most capital is and people who can go borrow money from like institutional places or family offices, or they can, they can raise money a lot cheaper than the average guy can. So it's, it's a very competitive space. Got it. Any other questions? Yeah, that's what the, what the going rate on DSCR loans was currently. Ooh, going rate. Yeah. As far as interest rates or yeah, the rates on DSCR loans. I have just about looked at it. Um, so I'm seeing, and, and it's a little bit different, right? So you would want to look at two different, like I could even just go DSCR loan rate on, I'm actually curious on, um, well, there's two different, right? Two different rates, right? So you're going to see them on like single family, family loans, which I'm going to guess those are probably around six to seven. Um, probably more like seven to eight, I'd say now, but, but the cool thing is, which I didn't, I kind of only touched on is if you're going through like, through like agency debt and working through Freddie, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, those ones typically drop by a point or two. So I, that's where I, I, I got a quote. I always just check with these um, big brokers that do these loans, but yeah, I think those are going to be somewhere between, they're probably close to six now. Um, but honestly, they may have pulled back a little bit because all interest rates did. The last time I had asked, they were right around 5.75. So you typically get a little bit of a break um, when you do these bigger, larger, kind of like a, it's not, I don't want to say jumbo loan because jumbo loan is typically like a single family house type loan. But again, once you get to a certain loan size, you can get, they basically they're backed by the government. So you get even better terms. Cool. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up there, guys. I'll save this recording for anybody who wants to come check it out and yeah, man. I hope if you guys do watch this, definitely let me know what questions you have. If you guys want to dive deeper and yeah, I'm excited to put this done. I'm excited to keep you guys up to date as we continue to go through the due diligence on this one and hopefully start to capture the before and afters because yeah, some of these units are pretty, pretty rough. So it'll be a cool, really cool, really cool before and after and really cool story to tell as we turn this thing around. All right, guys. Thanks for coming on. Mm -hmm.